Good morning, everyone in Asia, and uh, good evening to uh, everyone in the rest of the world. Um, this is a joint work uh, with Qingen, uh, Bingjing, uh, Qinghua, and Xiaodong. Bingjing and Xiaodong are also here uh, today to help answer the questions. Um, I'd like to uh, use this opportunity to uh, organizing this great conference, and also thank you for including our paper in this program. In this project, uh, we gather a group of um, micro and macro economies to uh, analyze a cultural productivity gap by using different approaches to account for selective migration. There are large income gaps between the agricultural and non-agricultural sectors in developing countries, a phenomenon which is known in the literature as agricultural productivity gap. Such sectoral income gaps remain sizable even after controlling for observable differences in worker characteristics, such as differences in human capital and the working hours between the two sectors. Since a large portion of the labor force in poor countries work in agriculture, the agricultural productivity gap is also the main reason for the large income disparity between rich and poor countries. Therefore, it is important to understand the sources of the agricultural productivity gap in order to understand why developing countries lag behind in aggreg aggregate productivity, as well as to inform the design of policies to help reduce income disparities between developing and developed countries. What accounts for the large observable cross-sectional agricultural productivity gap? Uh, in Where's the, the controller? Two competing explanations. Explanation to the unobserved. Um, I'm Joey, sorry to interrupt. Maybe you, Nigel, you can stop your video. Then it may help your connection to go smoother. It's a little bit uh, lacking. Okay. O only the slide and your voice that may be, that may help in case connection fail. Okay, I'll stop video. Um, yes. Better? Yes. Okay. Um, so let me move on. Um, so what accounts for the large observable cross-sectional APG? Uh, is the connection okay now? Yes. Because I can hear some uh, background noise here, so I'm not sure. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. So there are two competing explanations. Uh, one explanation refers to unobservable differences in worker characteristics. In this case, workers sort into different sectors based on their comparative advantage. Um, and another explanation uh, focus on barriers to worker mobility between the two sectors, which prevent rural workers from migrating to the more productive non-agricultural sector. Let me the full screen. Okay, so in the former case, um, the efficient sorting implies that there's little room for policymakers to reallocate labor to improve welfare. In contrast, in the later case, the APG reflects underlying sectorial productivity differences. The sectorial migration cost leads to mis uh, labor misallocation across sectors. Therefore, our policies that facilitate labor movement from the agricultural sector to the more productive non-agricultural sector could help to improve aggregate productivity and reduce income disparity. Hence, it is important to understand the sources of sectoral income gap in order to inform policy design. And this is particularly important for the developing world, given that a large portion of the labor force in developing countries works in the agricultural sector. In this paper, uh, you use detail, uh, we, be, we use detailed macro data to tackle this question and investigate uh, whether the agricultural productivity gap in China is a result of barriers to labor mobility or the sorting of workers based on unobserved characteristics. China provides an excellent case study because uh, there exists a lot of studies that show that there exists substantial migration barriers that restricts uh, rural urban migration. This figure uh, presents the raw agricultural productivity gap in the black line and the raw agricultural income gap in the blue line. So you can see that both gaps have been quite pronounced over the last 40 years. Does the 
observable uh, cross-sectional uh, income gap represent the underlying productivity gap that is uh, important uh, for policy consideration. Here we use a uh, simple uh, conceptual framework to show that these two may not be the same. So the output of a sector Y is a function of uh, labor productivity A times the aggregate human capital H. And the agri agricultural productivity gap measures the uh, productivity gap between the two sector after adjusted by a uh, producer price uh, P. So this is not directly observable. We, what we can observe in the data is the cross-sectional uh, agricultural productivity gap, which is the income gap uh, between the two sectors. So the income uh, is equal to the outcome times the producer price divided by total employment in that sector, uh, denoted by L. So this is the one typically used in the literature. Sorry. And you can see that um, we can decompose the uh, cross-sectional APG into two components. One is the underlying APG we care about, and the other measure the uh, difference in human capital across the two sectors. So the average human capital of sector is measured by the aggregate human capital H divided by the number of workers working in that sector L. So this component is affected by worker selection because the average human capital of workers in the non-agricultural sector may not equal to that of the workers uh, working in the agricultural sector. Suppose that workers are homogeneous, then we can show that the cross-sectional APG is equivalent to APG. And then no arbitrage condition implies that uh, APG uh, would be the same as average migration cost. This is because in the equilibrium, workers are indifferent between working in agricultural or non-agricultural sectors. However, if workers are heterogeneous in unobserved abilities, then uh, CEPG does not equal APG due to selection. So what if uh, we can uh, have an instrument that leads to an exogenous shot to uh, migration cost? Can we recover APG from IV estimate? So we know that IV estimate give us the local average treatment effect. It measures the income gain of uh, switchers or the compliers. So for compliers, um, they are indifferent between um, working in ag or non-ag sector. So their income gain equals the migration cost. So instead of recovering APG, what we get from IV estimate is actually the average migration cost of compliers. And uh, then APG uh, measured the average treatment effect because it captured the average income gain if we move all the individuals from agriculture to non-agricultural sector. And this cannot be directly estimated without imposing structural assumptions. So we need a structural model to recover APG. And uh, I will return to this point uh, when I get to the details of the paper. So here uh, in this paper, uh, we estimate APG and migration costs using panel data in rural China. First, we use an IV model to estimate migration costs non-parametrically. We make use of the rollout of the new rural pension scheme as an instrument. This pension program uh, does not directly affect the incomes of young adults, but it could affect their migration costs through intra-household resource allocation. And the next step is to use a structural model to estimate APG, migration costs, and selection bias together. So this is a, a standard Royal model where we allow individuals to differ in their agricultural and non-agricultural abilities, both of which are un unobserved to econometricians. And the model is also flexible in the sense that allow for differential returns to human capital between the two sectors. It also allows migration costs to vary across individuals. In this model, we again use the NRPS as an instrument 
to get a cleaner identification. So here is a preview of our main findings. So we show that controlling uh, for individual fixed effects does not have a big impact on the cross-sectional agricultural productivity gap. The OLS estimate shows that the average income of non-agricultural workers is 48% uh, higher than uh, that of um, um, agricultural workers. And the fixed effect estimate shows that for switchers, um, their uh, income gain is uh, 52%. Then we use the NRPS as an instrument to recover uh, migration costs for compliers. Uh, the estimate is 61% uh, of non-agricultural earnings. And lastly, uh, we use our structural model to recover APG migration costs and selection bias. We show that the AP average APG is 52%, suggesting that there exists a very large uh, productivity gap between the two sectors in China. And the APG is larger for men and younger workers. We also uh, quantify the migration costs, which account for around 55% of annual non-agricultural earnings. So we, shows that there, we show that there exists a sizable uh, migration barrier in China. Migration costs are also larger for female, less ed educated and older workers. Lastly, uh, we find that there exists negative selection in agricultural ability, in the sense that individuals with lower agricultural ability are more likely to migrate. So Nigel, can I ask you a question? I mean, when yeah, sure. these are very large costs you're estimating for migration, how should we think about these costs? I mean, these are not real out-of-pocket costs, right? We're, we're thinking about like the psychic cost of not living at yes. home all these yeah. things that people care about is, but it's not an actual cost in the sense of a, a cash requirement, right? Right, so uh, this is the cost after we accounting for the uh, income difference. So you're right that it includes a lot of uh, different type of costs. Uh, for example, it could be the um, cost on education and healthcare due to the Foucault system. It could also be the psychic cost uh, due to separation from uh, family. And it could also be due to a longer working hours in the uh, non-agricultural sector. Um, so uh, we consider all of this uh, into the migration cost measure. So a clarification, so this 50% uh, uh, earnings gap is nominal or real adjusted by uh, local price indexes. So we deflate the income uh, using the uh, local price index uh, from uh, brand and holds. So this is a real income. Uh, but yeah, based on the model, this would incorporate a, a producer price difference. So for instance, uh, housing uh, costs, uh, how do you kind of, uh, do you have a, uh, a formula to translate normal income to wel welfare, for instance? mainly you know local housing uh, price for instance um so here uh the price index we use is a measure of the prices uh for the same basket of goods um in rural so uh, we compare the same basket of goods and look at how the price differ across sectors um and in this study, uh, we focus on the income gap. Um, and in terms of how to translate that into welfare, uh, that, that's a deeper question. Um, we need to think more about that. I guess, I mean, I guess the policy relevant question really is how much of these uh, costs can be altered with policies, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's housing or HUCO and how much is really kind of fairly intrinsic and are, are, is, is not something you can really affect. Because uh, yeah, most people, if you just say the cost is this high, they'll just say, oh, it can't be that high, right? Right, right, that, that's a great question. So here, we, we, what we try to do is to link a migration cost with individual characteristics. So we allow that to vary by uh, gender, education, and age. Um, and one 
thing we are doing now is we are trying to link it with some Google reform index. So we're <laughs> using the index developed by Jingting. Um, so uh, we try to look at how, as uh, Google reforms going on, uh, how the migration costs are reduced uh, due to the Hukou uh, reform. Um, so uh, when, but for, for today's presentation, we don't have uh, a very um, um, finalized result on that part yet. So I, I decided not to present that part, but that's in our research agenda. Hey, so, Niger, mm -hmm. so have you considered the, uh, the rural industry, you know, you can, switch from ag to non-ag without migration. Uh, talk about the rural factories, township bridge enterprises. Uh, so have you considered so that uh, so you are treating migration and the sector switching equally, right? That's but right, the, but the, these two terms interchangeably. Yeah, right, right, right. So, my question is, uh, there are large rural industry, farmers can switch sector from ag to non-ag mm. without migration. That's right. That's well, right. Not, 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 not completed. Sorry, I'm interrupting. So, so the yeah. all mi migrants definition here is yeah. has to be out of town. So it cannot be local TV. That's not, uh, that's not all migration measure. So we, they have to be because in, in the data, that's why they ask in, in the surveys, they ask you, do you work out of town? Only if you work out of town, then they will ask you about the in town and so on. So we are only looking at these switchers who have switched out of town. But yeah, so can you observe the cases when you switch sector, but not the out No, of you don't, we don't know the income. Well, we don't know yeah. the income. Okay. Unfortunately, yeah, we don't know their income if they work in the within town non agricultural sector. Okay. Okay. So uh, let me briefly talk about the literature. Um, our study contributes to the literature that estimates agricultural productivity by accounting for select migration. We apply the individual fixed effect model used in uh, Alvarez, uh, Higgs and all, and Lagacos et al. And we point out that the fixed effect model cannot solve the selection problem. Um, and the instrumental variable uh, has been used in two recent papers by Lagacos et al. And we provide a new interpretation of the IV estimate. The comparative advantage module follows the idea of Lagacos and Wu and Young, uh, where they illustrate how workers with sector specific skills can sort themselves into different sectors. So without uh, APG, uh, there can still generate um, a large differences in average wages just due to sorting. So our model setup is close to that of Polito and Swaiki, but uh, we obtain cleaner identification uh, through uh, using an instrument. In addition, uh, we allow for heterogeneous migration costs which have been shown to be important in the literature. Lastly, our study is related to the literature on misallocation and productivity. We show that there exists a sizable productivity gap and large migration costs, which suggests that labor is greatly misallocated across sectors. We also provide uh, micro foundations to explain how migration costs vary by individual characteristics. The data set we use uh, is the National Fixed Point Survey. Uh, this is an annual panel survey collected by the Chinese Ministry of Agriculture uh, starting in 1986. The data set uh, covers over 20,000 households from all the 31 provinces. It starts to collect individual information from 2003. And the data available to us is from 2003 to 2012. So we have a 10 year uh, panel data. The biggest advantage of this data set is that it tracks both rural residents and the migrants. So even if our workers work out of town, uh, the survey still collect information on their individual earnings and working days. 
Um, so in this data set, it does not directly uh, ask about individual agricultural earnings. So we calculate it by using, by allocating households agricultural value agricultural working days. And value added is calculated by using the sum of output minus um, so for uh, non-agricultural earnings, uh, we, know, uh, we know the earnings at the individual level. Um, so for each individual, it would report their uh, days and annual earnings uh, if they work out of time. So um, we define an individual as working in the non-agricultural sector if he or she work more than 180 days out of town within a year. And the incomes, uh, the earnings are deflated using the price index uh, from brand and holds. Here we restrict our samples uh, to adults age 20 to 54 with a college degree. Uh, we exclude uh, college graduates because they are more likely to obtain uh, urban hukou uh, so that they cannot be uh, tracked in our study, in our survey. Um, based on our uh, definition of ag and non-ag workers, uh, here uh, we present the distribution of working days in different sectors. Uh, the upper panel shows that uh, most of the agricultural workers have zero working days um, in the within non-agricultural sector and out of town non-agricultural sector. And for non-agricultural workers, uh, the majority of them have zero working days in uh, agricultural sector and within town non-agricultural sectors. So in this uh, paper, uh, we defined um, whether you work in, um, so we think that the definition of um, the sector of working uh, is uh, mostly in line with uh, whether you work out of town. Nadja, we can't like hear we lost her. Right. So probably, can we ask Shadow? to continue. Yeah, but I don't think he can move the slides if she doesn't unshare. N Nija, if you can hear us, maybe you should exit and try to re-enter. I can kick her, let me kick her out. Let me, let me, no, let me try I'll to give her another me. second. I can kick her out, where is she? Oh, there we go. Okay, she's unshared. Uh, I have the slides, I can share if, uh, so you want to yeah why, why don't you share the slide joey and then shadon can continue and if she comes back we'll we'll just do this again sorry for the disruption okay okay shadon are you ready oh all right the problem is that i didn't prepare the slide so <laughs> uh all right let me see if you can get in back yeah. do, your, yeah, do, do your best okay okay she's is he... yes, it's me. I'm it's back. Back. Oh, okay. It's back now. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm so sorry. I um, don't know why the connections. Do you want to okay, so... share your slides or use mine? I can share my slide if you don't mind. Okay, okay. So, uh, where, where, uh, were I? Uh, so I was talking about the data and let me see. You're talking about, talking the, about the distribution. distribution. Yeah, the, the distribution of the distribution. Two okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, so you can see that the uh, non ag sector has a, a larger mean, uh, but has a smaller standard deviation. Um, so the the reason is that um, here, uh, our sample only includes those individuals with rural hukou. 
Um, so we do not include uh, urban local people. That's why uh, we get a smaller standard deviation in the non-X sector compared to that in the X sector. So uh, we use the individual fixed effect model as the first attempt to control for uh, unobserved characteristics. So in this regression, uh, the dependent variable is a log daily earning. Um, the key independent variable is an indicator that equals one if individual work in the non-agricultural sector. We control for individual fixed effect and time fixed effects, as well as uh, individual control variables. This table presents the uh, cross-sectional ORS results. Um, so the coefficient of non-ag uh, suggests that uh, the average income uh, of workers in the non-agricultural sector is 48% higher than uh, that of those in the agricultural sector. And we further divide the sample based on their migration uh, destination. And you can see that the income gap is largest for individuals who uh, work outside of home province. So in general, we find that um, the uh, income gap increases with migration distance. This suggests that there might be some compensating differential. And then we include the individual fixed effect. The uh, coefficient of non-ag increases slightly uh, to 52%. So note that the individual fixed effect captures the uh, uh, mind the, the effect on the switchers. So this, to interpret this result, we can think about this as uh, if an individual uh, switch from agricultural to non-agricultural sector, their income would increase by uh, 52%. So if we compare our results with the literature, we'll find that our findings are actually quite different. So all of the existing studies show that the inclusion of individual fixed effect lead to a large reduction in the uh, agricultural productivity gap. So this includes Hicks and all uh, who study Indonesia and Kenya, Alvarez who use uh, Brazilian data, and Lagacos et al who use data from six countries. So note that Lagacos et al also provide an estimate of APG uh, in China. So they show that the cross-sectional APG is 55%. And after they include individual fixed effect, the estimate drops to 16%. So why there exists a difference between their estimate and ours? Here, we try to replicate their results by using the same data set they use and a, a similar uh, specification. So they use the China Family Panel Study, which covers uh, which is a panel data from 2010 to 2016. So first, uh, we are able to replicate uh, their main results. So they, they use nominal consumption instead of real income to measure the agricultural productivity gap. And there are a few differences in, uh, in the specification between their approach and our approach. So first is that um, our sample only includes individuals with rural home. And the second difference is that um, the definition of non-act worker is different. So they, they define a non-act worker uh, if uh, he or she live in the urban area, while we define it based on their sector of work. So we show that these two specifications uh, do not have a big impact on the estimate. The biggest difference comes from the uh, measure of APG. So we use real income or they use nominal consumption. You can see that uh, when we switch to real income, the estimate of fixed effect uh, increases to 53%, which is similar to what we find in our data set. So this is uh, probably because uh, consumption is less volatile than income. So for switchers, the change in their income may be much smaller than their change in uh, sorry, the change in their consumption may be much smaller than the change in their income because people tend to smooth their consumption over the life cycle. But then, Nigel, so that yes. goes back to my earlier question. So suppose, you know, uh, housing is a, a big factor. Then, you know, this kind of uh, uh, income uh, gap cannot be really interpreted as a kind of institutional barriers to uh, rural urban migration. 
Think mm -hmm. about one way to think about you know the small consumption difference and the big so-called real income difference, but without uh, adjusted by housing price. Mm -hmm. So for most of the migrants, they're temporary migrants. So um, most of them cannot afford a house in the urban yeah, but area. But rental price still, you know, is quite different, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Um, yeah. So that would be a little bit tricky uh, to adjust for the living cost. Uh, but but we think that maybe real income is better than consumption because consumption um, is not very sensitive uh, to your sector of choice. Um, so in general, uh, even if you work in the urban area, um, the type of goods you consume may be quite different, uh, quite, uh, maybe very similar to uh, the one you um, assume uh, when you're in the rural area. So the real income um, may, um, be a more appropriate measure uh, for agricultural productivity. But uh, you're could right also have a, Sorry, Nigel, could also have a clarifying question? I think yes, the sir. big difference, yeah, the big difference here is the big decline, all, always coming from the big decline of OS to FE. I, I think it's true that, you know, their magnitude is now comparable to your FE, but there, you, we, we still see a big, um, drop from their OS to, mm -hmm. to FE here too, right? So I've been wondering yeah. why for all these papers in that literature, you always see a big difference between OS and FE, even they use this China sample of CFPS where in your data case, you know, that, that you, don't, you don't find the similar uh, finding. One thing that I noticed that it seems like their sample size shrink a lot. Um, uh, when they go from OS, when you use real income, I'm I'm not sure whether the specific sample selection play a role or not, but just to, you know, maybe you guys know more. Right. Um, so this is because there there is um, non-trivial attrition rate uh, in CFPS. So if you run fixed event model, it requires you to observe the same individual for at least uh, two times. So this is the reason for the uh, drop in the number of observations. And you're right that. Um, so uh, even using CFPS, they still find a big drop after the inclusion of fixed effects. But um, know that uh, their sample period is different. So our uh, data covers um, 2003 to 2013, while the CFPS covers uh, 2010 to 2016. Um, and as I will show later in a, a theoretical model, uh, the size of migration costs would affect uh, the relative size of the OIS and fixed effect estimates. And one right. caveat right. of the fixed effect estimates is that it only captured the uh, income gain for switchers. And switchers are non-randomly selective. And in different periods, uh, switchers could be different. Um, so that's probably um, why our results are different. Can, can I follow up uh, on your answer? Uh, uh, yeah, so I guess, uh, uh, that's a good question. I, th I think uh, m maybe also has to do with the sample. So the, because they define the people in non ag as one who live in non ag So some of them could already get the urban who call. So we are looking at probably more diverse group of people uh, of switchers. Where in, in our sample, we are look at this uh, rural based surveys and we only see the, the people who are with rural who calls. So we think, so these are basically really are, we, we are looking at those time frame mi migrations. These are the, the uh, who who didn't get the uh, urban hook hole. and therefore may, and 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 in general, I think uh, you can show with with, with log normal distribution the, how, the 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 bias of fixed effects with OIR depend on the variety of dispersion of abilities between the two sectors. So in our case, okay. we, we, we find that there's much larger dispersion for ag, non ag. Maybe in their sample, we, we should check. Maybe in their sample, they have a larger dispersion in the non ag. Yeah, that would be something good to, good to check. Okay, got it. Yeah. As I just mentioned, uh, the individual fixed effect regression does not control for all selection biases. Um, so this is because. Uh, uh, it captures the income gain for switchers and workers who switch out of agriculture 
are the ones uh, who had smaller migration costs or a larger uh, comparative advantage. And the change in migration costs could be endogenous. For example, uh, if migration costs decline more for individuals with larger comparative advantage, the fixed effect estimate could have an upward bias. Therefore, uh, we use an instrumental variable model to provide an exogenous shock to migration costs that exogenously shift individuals from X to non-X sector. So the instrument we use here is the new rural pension scheme. So it started the first round of pilot in 2009. And after four rounds of expansion, it achieved national coverage by 2012. This pension program provides basic pension benefits for individuals age 60 or above. The basic pension benefit is 55 yuan per month. So this is around 30% of uh, monthly income for elderly 60, age 60 or above. So this is a non-trivial amount for the elderly. For adults age below 60, the uh, pension program does not directly affect the incomes in the two sectors. However, it could affect their migration costs if they have an elderly age above 60 in the household. So, so Nigel, I have a question here about this last sentence. I mean, mm -hmm. the pension program affects many things about intergenerational relations, like elderly support. It, it certainly uh, is likely to affect the labor supply maybe of individuals and uh, how much income they feel they need to earn to meet the obligations of their family members. So I'm just wondering this assumption that the NRPS only affects migration costs, but not incomes or not labor supply or effort and any of those things. I mean, could you comment on that? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, so in order for this instrument to be uh, valid, uh, we need an exclusion restriction which means that it only affects their income through the uh, migration decision. Um, so here, uh, we, what we try to argue is that this pension program does not affect the potential income uh, for uh, uh, migrants because uh, it will only affect um, their cost of uh, working in the non-agricultural sector, um, but not um, how much they could potentially earn uh, if they work in ag or non-ag sector. So one caveat could be that um, maybe uh, when uh, the elderly get richer uh, through some kind of intra-household resource allocation, maybe the um, agricultural production is changed. Um, so we, uh, we are uh, trying to analyze whether uh, the NRPS has a direct impact on the agricultural production in the household uh, to see whether um, the exclusion restriction is valid. Uh, but for now, um, I think um, seems like, um, so the direct impact is through uh, affecting migration costs, um, but not uh, through the affecting the potential income. Does that answer your question, Albert? Um, okay. Yeah, it still seems like a strong assumption to me, but why don't you go ahead? Okay, because in the model, uh, we don't uh, directly model the hours of work. So, so the only decision for us is whether you work in ag or non-ag sector. So, so maybe the labor supply concern is, uh, is not quite relevant here. Okay, so let, let me, let me um, talk about the potential mechanisms through, through, through which uh, the NRPS affect migration costs. Um, so first of all, um, the uh, NRPS uh, make the elderly less likely to rely on the elder care uh, provided by children. Um, so we also use our data to show that it increased the consumption of healthcare service for the elderly. So this uh, would release the elder care burden for potential migrants. And secondly, uh, the uh, NRPS uh, reduced the labor supply of the elderly. So using our data, we show that it reduces the time uh, the elderly spend uh, in farm work. So they have more time to spend on their children. So this will release the childcare burden for young adults. 
Lastly, uh, if parents could transfer part of the pension benefit to their adult children, this could relax the credit constraint uh, for potential migrants. So here is our IV uh, specification. Um, so here we use the triple difference uh, specification. So the uh, instrument here is the interaction of whether the household has an early age above 60 and uh, uh, whether the county has the uh, new rural pension scheme. So the intuition here is that uh, the NRPS would only affect the migration costs for households uh, with an early age 60 or above. So this table shows uh, the IV results. The first column presents the first stage estimate. Uh, you can see that the NRPS leads to an increase in the chance of working in the non-agricultural sector by four percentage points uh, for individuals with an early in the household. And the third column presents the two-stage least square estimate, which is 61%. So how shall we interpret the IV estimate? Is it equivalent to APG? Here, we provide a simple comparative advantage model to provide an interpretation of our IV estimate. Um, in this model, each worker is endowed with a vector of individual productivities, CA and CN, which follow joint normal distribution. So we use uh, R to represent APG. Um, so we normalize the uh, productivity in the agricultural sector to be one. The migration cost uh, is M, which is proportional to non-agricultural income. So the log income net of migration cost in the non-agricultural sector is log M plus log R plus CM. Um, the log income in the A sector is uh, simply CA. So we denote V as the comparative advantage, which equals CM minus CA. The share of workers in the non-agricultural sector is given by pi n. So this is a function of the APGR, the migration cost mu, and the uh, standardization of the comparative advantage. Observe average income of workers in the agricultural sector is the uh, expected uh, agricultural ability conditional on uh, working in the agricultural sector. And we can also write down uh, the observed average income of workers in the non ag sector, which equals uh, the APG plus the expect, expected uh, non-agricultural ability conditional working in the non-agricultural sector. So if we take the difference between these two terms, we see that uh, what we get is the observed cross-sectional APG. So this is the uh, difference between the average income of the two sector. So it equals to uh, R plus two additional components which depend on the distribution of abilities and migration costs. So what we try to recover uh, is APG. So in this model, APG is the average treatment effect. This is because uh, this measured um, the average income get in town game if we move everyone from agriculture to non-agricultural sector. So this is exactly captured by R. And if there exists sorting, uh, the OLS estimate would be biased because it includes uh, not only R, but two additional terms due to selection. And how do we interpret the IV estimate? So for IV estimate, we get the local average treatment effect. So it measures the income gain for compliers who move from ag to non ag sector given a decline in the migration cost from mu to mu prime. Okay, so you can see that the late estimate does not equal APG either. It equals R, uh, which is APG plus an additional term that's also related to the uh, distribution of abilities and the migration cost. In an extreme case uh, where changes in migration costs are infinitely small, so we set delta goes to zero, the late estimate can be rewritten as the following. And you can see that it equals mu, which is the migration cost rather than R. And we prove that this property 
does not depend on the functional form assumption of abilities and it holds for general distribution. So the intuition is that uh, the IBS may capture the local average treatment effect of uh, marginal workers. So for marginal workers, their uh, income gain, which is the left hand side here, is exactly equal to their migration cost. So uh, what we get from late estimate when uh, the change in migration cost is relatively small is the migration cost. And if the uh, change in migration cost is non-trivial, then what we get is a lower bound estimate of migration cost. So here we show that uh, the IV estimate does not give us R or the APG. So we need to, in order to recover APG, we need uh, structural assumptions, which means that we need um, a structural model. And lastly, uh, know that uh, what we find in the reduced form analysis is that IV estimate is bigger than OLS. So we can write down the difference between these two estimates as the following by assuming that IV give us the uh, migration cost mu. So we derive two sufficient conditions for OLS to be less than IV. So first we need the uh, standard, standard deviation of agricultural ability to be bigger than that of non-ag ability. And second, uh, we need a migration cost to be sufficiently large. All right, um, so um, the next step will be- All right, can I, can I, can I interrupt again? Major. Sorry about that. Uh, Nigel, I have a question. Sure, I sure. mean, I, I'm, now I'm realizing how you're calculating these measures. And one concern I have is that, so in the individual fixed effects, you're really comparing a, a, a person who is working on the farm in one period and then moves off farm. But when they're on the farm, it's very hard to measure their income because you're just measuring the family income and you're kind of allocating part of the family income to them. That's and if, right. if, uh, so that could easily be biased. Let's say there are very productive people who, whether in agriculture or non agriculture, who are switching, mm -hmm. and then, uh, then you may be underestimating their agricultural income, right? Before they leave, if, if you're, and, and it's just impossible to know how to allocate that income mm -hmm. other than using some kind of very primitive type of a, uh, mm -hmm. of a splitting rule, right? Yeah, yeah, because we only know the uh, household agricultural income. So what we are doing now is to allocate the household agricultural earnings uh, according to their agricultural working days. And we, in an earlier version, we tried an alternative specification by allocating based on their human capital uh, and the working days. So uh, we recover uh, the human capital based on um, the census 2005 data. So in census 2005, we know their individual income. So we regress that on their um, education, gender, and age. So we get a formula to calculate their human capital. And based on that, uh, we reallocate the um, household agricultural uh, earnings to the individual level, and we find a similar results. Uh, I agree that there's no ideal way <laughs> to allocate earnings, uh, but it seems the results are robust. Um, well, on one, one thing you can, you can see how the agricultural income falls when they leave, if, they, if, if the families are, have people in both places, that would be one way to confirm how big the productivity differences are. But then I, I wanna also ask a question about, again, about identification. So now, now I actually, when you, first you said you're gonna use the rural pension program, I thought you were gonna do something quite different. I thought, there's, there's been work that suggests, you know, if you give increase the benefits in rural areas, people will are less likely to leave, right? So that there's this uh, the reduction, there's this kind of a stay effect because people now feel like, oh, they can uh, get a pension at home, so why should I migrate? But you're, you're, you're just using the 60 year olds and above and using it as a cash kind of constraint relief mechanism, which is, and, and though it has the opposite effect that it actually increases out migration. But it doesn't right. mean this other effect doesn't exist, even though it's not significant in your regressions. And also, even for families with 60 year olds, they have, um, I mean, there's work, you know, you, I'm sure you're aware of this, the work finds that the, the, the 60 year olds and above are gonna reduce their labor supply uh, right. when they get That's the, pen, when they get the cash that. pension, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that al already means that if you're doing some equal income division rule that you know, the income is going to 
Well, I mean, you're, you're still using it while they're there, but it, it does mean yeah. that the, the comparison kind of also becomes a bit biased. Mm -hmm. So here but, we but, but Albert, the... Albert, Albert, that's, that's exactly actually the, 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 the mechanism we try to argue to lower the migration costs, right? The, the older people reduce the labor supply so they can take care more time to have, uh, take care of the to grandchildren. Yeah, but it's also, it's the... also, re but I'm just saying, I mean, theoretically, Xiaodong, it's, it's also affecting the productivity of not migrating. So in other words, if, if I know that uh, my family labor supply has fallen because the older people don't want to work anymore because they got a pension, mm -hmm. that means if I stay home, then I'm actually going to be, uh, you know, more productive uh, because assuming some, you know, decreasing marginal productivity in agriculture. And then that means that your bias is actually, you know, the opposite way that uh, that would, that would, that means you're underestimating the effect of this program on migration through the cash channel because there's a countervailing uh, labor productivity channel that is now being affected as well, right? I mean, just giving you an example. I mean, there may be other kind of stories, but just to assume that the only thing affected is the yeah. the cost seems a little bit, you know, right? Like yeah, I guess I guess, I guess it depends on the, which which way the bias. We we also saw that maybe with with this pension. Oh, please hold on. Uh, oh, sorry. We, out of time. we don't have time? Okay. We're we out of time. So please respond to Albert's question after okay. Nigel's presentation, okay? Nigel, uh, please go ahead. You only have uh, uh, right. at most, you know, five minutes. So, uh, please, please go ahead. Okay. Um, sorry for the delay. Um, so let me quickly go through the extended model. So here, uh, well, in the last step, we try to estimate the structural model. So we allow the model be, to be uh, flexible in a sense that it allow for differential returns to human capital between the two sectors. And we also incorporate heterogeneous migration costs. Uh, when estimating the model, again, we use the NRPS as an instrument. So in this model, uh, R captures the price of human capital. The capital H is the uh, sector specific human capital and the little h is the annual working days. Um, the human capital depends on individual's gender, uh, age, and education, and we allow for differential returns to human capital ca captured by beta S. The human capital also depends on sector-specific ability and ID shock. And the value of working in a sector is equal to the log earnings minus uh, migration costs if applied. So in, for individuals who work in the non x sector, there exists an annual migration cost which also depend on individual characteristics, our instrument and ID shock. Um, and for those who switch from act to non-act sector, there's a one-time migration cost, uh, which also has a similar functional form. So, um, and in, in this uh, run model, uh, it's quite uh, standard. And so workers choose uh, their uh, sector of work based on uh, the uh, expected utility and we capture both the out migration and the return migration decisions. Uh, we use maximum likelihood to estimate the model. So given uh, the time uh, limit, uh, let me just uh, directly jump to the estimation results. So this table presents the uh, estimates for our uh, prices for human capital for ag and non ag sector in two separate columns and the uh, first row captures the average price. So the difference between these two uh, give us the APG. So you can see it's around a 52%. And we also allow APG to vary uh, across individuals based on their demographic characteristics. And the APG is larger for men and uh, younger workers. Another set of parameters of interest is the uh, distribution of abilities. And we find that the uh, Agricultural ability has a larger variance than that of non-ag ability, and the two abilities are positively correlated. And this table presents the estimation results for migration costs. Um, so for, uh, for the uh, average cost, it's uh, shown in the first row, and you can see that the average annual migration cost is around 53% of um, annual non-agricultural earnings. For those who switch sectors, there is an additional one-time migration cost, which is relatively small, 
which is around 2% uh, of uh, non-agricultural earnings. So for those people who uh, move from ag to non-ag, the total out-migration cost is the sum of this two, which is uh, 55%. And we also show that both annual migration costs and out-migration costs are larger for female, uh, less educated, and older workers. And we also find that the NRPS significantly reduces the uh, migration costs and the effect concentrates on those individuals with an outlay in the household. Then we can use the uh, model to quantify the selection bias. So this uh, figure presents the distribution of agricultural ability for people who work in the ag or non-ag sector. So we can see that uh, Individuals with lower agricultural ability are more likely to work in the non-ag sector as presented in the blue line. And this figure shows the distribution of non-ag ability and we do not find much selection going on uh, in terms of uh, non-ag ability. And lastly, we can plot the distribution of comparative advantage, which is measured by the difference between non-ag and ag ability. So not surprisingly, we find that individuals with higher comparative advantage are more likely to move to the non-ag sector. So overall, we find negative selection in agricultural ability in the sense that individuals with lower agricultural ability are more likely to migrate. And we do not find much selection in terms of non-agricultural ability. And uh, this result is uh, kind of intuitive because based on our estimate of the ability distributions, we find that the covariance between comparative advantage and uh, agricultural ability is negative. So this is, uh, can be generated uh, if uh, we have uh, the stand division of agricultural ability is greater than the stand division of non-ag ability, which is also uh, shown in the estimation results. And based on our simple model, we uh, prove that this together with a sufficiently large migration cost imply that IV estimate is bigger than OLS. So our structural estimation results um, provide uh, support to our uh, reduced form analysis. Okay, um, so I'll probably stop here given that I already overrun. Uh, so uh, the solution is yeah. self-explanatory. Sorry for the bad connection and thank you for your patience. Uh, so let's uh, formally uh, end uh, this morning, uh, uh, today's session. Uh, if you have uh, questions, so please stay here. And I also would like to invite all the speakers uh, to stay with us uh, for a while in case that, you know, uh, participants have uh, uh, more questions about presentation. So I have the, I have a, I have two questions for for uh, Xiaodong and Nigel. The first, the first one is very uh, much. Uh, I, I want to hear the answer to to Albert. Actually, I, I I do have the same concern. I think the marginal, the marginal product of the uh, the kind of marginal output of this individual. If you want to understand how household production model, uh, one can easily think about this policy variation. You guys will think. Uh, using as IV could affect that, that aspect too. Have you ever actually tried some other IV? In particular, I know that uh, Ifan has a really nice paper which possibly could be leveraged, uh, you know, something like a crop, uh, uh, some, some, something like, you know, the, the general price, you seems to see the crop mix, you know, maybe some general commodity price or even rainfall could affect the uh, maybe not not actually immune from Albert's concern, but I just wonder if you try multiple IVs to show your results actually robust or not. Have you ever thought about that? Um, yeah. the, 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 uh, and, and also a second question actually shall also to you. I remember a few years ago I discussed a, also a, a very nice paper by your Toronto colleagues like Diego. Lauren and uh, Jessica Light and another cause right. I, I yeah uh, struck me as very, so similar favor I just uh, because but my memory faded I just wonder like you know compare with yeah. that paper you know what what are the what are the key differences that you guys are exploring compared with their findings they right. they seem to have also have a Roy sorting model 
which they have, have the right uh, they have yeah, they yeah. have a roy model and then they calibrate and so here we really want to we really want to get at the selection and try to separate the selection and try to use the micro data take advantage of fully the, and they don't have the instrument right? so they just uh, matching moments um, i see i see and so, so okay. right so that's what we do and uh, yeah, I mean, the instrument is not, I think it's not the perfect instrument. Uh, I mean, the problem with the crop is that the, you, you would think the, the crops, the, even the weather, weather will be heterogeneous uh, across villages. And, uh, and, those, and, and it will directly affect both the, the income in agriculture and migration. So, yes. so, so that, that will kind of... Uh, not satisfy the exclusion restriction because we are we because all depend if all depend on variable like in Yifan's case he's looking at not agriculture income that's okay but we mm. all depend on variable is a difference so then 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 then, then you, you you we don't get this exclusion uh, restriction I see got it right okay. so I guess related to Albert's question so some of the cases I think. Uh, it could be biased, and but we think the bias may be in the right direction. Like for example, when when the when this uh, household get the pension, now there's an income effect, so there could be for them it's like the insurance, like uh, Chris Chris Woodrick and other people talk about. Then they may actually switch to a, a cash crop, more risky crops, which would tend to increase the average income. Which means then that our estimate will be underestimate uh, the productivity gap, because now they they, are, they 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 change the behavior, so the average income is higher than it would have been without the uh, low like, without this pension. So if that's okay, because uh, because the, the the literature is trying to say selection may ac actually get rid of all the uh, productivity gap. So what we want mm -hmm. to say that. So all basically the, the motivation of this paper says, well, we know there's barriers in China, and uh, let's look at the Chinese data. If we find the same, if we cannot find the barriers, I'll be very surprised, right? So, so we want to kind of get a lower bound of that. So, if it's a lower bound, I'm fine. We are we're, we're happy with it. But if it's the bias the other way around, then we're, then then it's a bit more problematic. Got it. Uh, Ping Jing, so your co-author. Uh, oh, yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So, uh, Nigel, can you go back to the regression table about the IVE results? So I just want to uh, get back to Albert's and Daniel's earlier concern about the uh, exclusion restriction. I totally understand there are many, many potential uh, mechanisms there that could bias our IV. And I think the underlying question is how severely those, uh, the bias could be. So I would like to see the regression table, Nadia. Uh, one moment here. Yeah. Uh, yes. So uh, here is one of the suggested evidence uh, trying to test the exclusion restrictions. So please focus on column two and column four. So in particular, in column four, we simultaneously include the uh, uh, migration status as well as our instruments. So you can see that once we include uh, the non-act dummy there, the, our IV actually totally lose uh, its statistical significance as well as economic significance. So uh, I actually take it as some suggested uh, evidence for the exclusion restriction, but I would be happy to uh, discuss with you if you have a better suggestion, like how we can test or how we can tease out different mechanisms better. Well, one thought I had, if you're really leveraging the, you're, you seem to be just leveraging the fact that these 60 year olds are getting a cash infusion from the pension program, mm -hmm. and this somehow relieves the credit constraint. By the way, the language you use where you say it reduces the migration costs is, I don't think that's the right way to express it. If you're a credit constrained household, there's gonna be, you just can't afford to move. So there's gonna be a big gap uh, between your local productivity and the non-farm wage, it's going to be greater than the migration cost probably because you just can't finance the migration cost. So there's, not, there's no arbitrage condition linking the two productivities anymore. And so by getting some cash and relieving the cre credit constraint, you know, it will reduce that 
uh, gap. So it's not really changing the migration cost. It's really uh, changing the measure gap in incomes. I don't know. I, I'm just thinking about, because of course costs aren't changing, right? You're just getting cash. So it's your ability to pay the costs is, was changed. So uh, uh -huh. that's another thing. But, but anyhow, getting back to the main point is that if you really want to leverage just this cash infusion, shouldn't you just be comparing villages that already have NRPS and then the parents uh, change from being less than 60 to being more than 60 years old from one wave to the next? And suddenly there's cash and everything else is the same, actually. So then that would be a very pure test. Although I think the number of households, I think it may be un underpowered. Uh, but if the sample size is big enough, that would, that seems the most pure kind of way to, to test these assumptions. Yeah, I guess what Albert is suggesting is the regression discontinuity approach. Um, I think we tried that before, but um, you're right that we're lack of power. So. Um, the result is not significant. So uh, let me let me follow up on uh, Daniel's question on uh, 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 Diego uh, Lawrence and their courses uh, paper. So I think they did, now they are looking at within village uh, ag uh, non ag uh, switch right, and uh, methodologically I think they are also quite different from you guys. So did they use this kind of uh, overtime variation uh, in, the, uh, in a panel to estimate uh, this kind of switching cost or whatever? No, no. I mean, so, so basically, I think, uh, yeah, so they, they used to this, uh, for example, uh, in order to match the moments, uh, they need to, for example, the correlation is very difficult. You do, so what they use, for example, is the people who in the same year has worked substantial time in ag and substantial time in non-ag. Right. And using that to calculate the correlation of that. So the, again, those are very selected sample, but they use that to kind of match some unconditional, uh, some uh, like uh, uh, to, 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 to universal average. So I think that's uh, right. So I think, uh, I th I would say that there's more calibration rather than try to identification. Yeah. 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 Got it. Any other questions? Uh, so do I have a question on the RCIE sample? Yeah. Uh, I have used the data before. Uh, the aging is a big problem because they select the villages and the sample households. They never change them. So yeah. Also, there's another sample selection problem in village. They tend to select literate farmers because the farmers have to keep dairy. Uh, so there's a sample selection problem. This why you find capable farmers. Uh, farmers tend to be more capable of working in the. I mean, of the well, I think. Well, I think in, in the. I, well, I, I may be wrong, but I think uh, they have, yeah, there's a selection bias in terms of. Uh, villages because there's attrition and the, the, the mix of agriculture they're not very diligent in terms of uh, choosing the new, new new villages to make sure it's representative so that's is a fixed point so that's a potential problem however i think once they choose a village they they they, they will have uh, all the households in there it's not select selected just a few households to uh, no 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 uh, uh... They, because they ask farmers to write dairy, they have to find the uh, literate farmers in their in their. Uh, I don't. I also don't think it's a census of all households. I don't think it's a census. I mean, look at our sample size, right? So we, we have about three hundred some 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 uh, villages. How many households we have? Twenty thousand households uh, each year. Right, twenty thousand households each year, and we we only have three hundred fifty around three hundred fifty villages. So you look at the household per village is quite large. Yeah, but I guess it's only representative uh, when they just get started. Um, so it's probably mm -hmm. no longer yeah, representative a, nowadays. Yeah. 